please uh, take a couple minutes, uh, finish food, and uh, find your seat. So the, today's meet, tonight's meet but will just uh, start soon. Thanks. I'm in charge of the speaker invitation for the meetup. Again, well, welcome everyone to uh, join tonight's uh, Bay Area Research Meetup. Um, so before we start the program, normally, uh, uh, is there anyone want to uh, make any announcement? Nobody? Uh, well, so eBay is still hiring, uh, in case people are interested. Uh, just uh, send your resume uh, to any of the eBay folks uh, uh, in tonight's meetup. Um, so, so tonight we have uh, uh, Nick White, uh, eBay fellow, uh, to talk to us about eBay's uh, newly launched uh, next search engine, Cassini. And so, so there's something uh, uh, joking about is that uh, in eBay, uh, as a big company, we have maybe hundreds of VPs, but as an eBay fellow, there are only uh, a couple of them. So Nick is just uh, one of them. Um, it's a very honorable title. Uh, before saying too much, I'll just hand over to Nick to start tonight's talk. Thanks very much. Uh, please give uh, Nick a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Is, it, is my microphone working? It sounds like it's working fine. I apologize, my voice is a little scratchy, my cough a bit, so if I destroy your eardrums, I apologize in advance. Um, so. I joined eBay three years ago. I think actually today might be my three-day three-year anniversary. Uh, so I came in just about when the idea that we might need to rewrite our search engine was happening. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of what the past about Voyager in terms of you know motivating some of the changes we made. Uh, but I'm not a Voyager expert. There are some folks in the room here who know a lot more about the history of eBay search and maybe they'll chime in depending on the questions that come up. Um, just so you know, I hate talking from slides, so I'm happy to take questions and I feel better sort of question and answer conversational kind of stuff. Uh, this presentation doesn't have a big story arc to it. It's a bunch of pieces of different parts of the story. Uh, part of that is that um, the Cassini project wasn't just about creating new search features for eBay. It was also about improving the way we operate a search business. And so a lot of the engineering aspects of this kind of project is more about the business story of how we operate within the company. And in some ways, you know, adding new features was sort of the easy part, you might say. Um, so let me dive in. Uh, oh, uh, you'll also quickly notice I don't like diagrams. So hopefully you're good at staying awake, only receiving text on the slide. Um, so some folks are wondering, so what is Cassini? You know, it's a, it's a search engine. Um, it's really a combination of a search engine platform in terms of other people within the company can build search experiences on top of this. So it's not what we call Cassini inside of eBay is not what our customers directly interact with. Uh, which you're, you're interacting with our search front end team and the work they do, and our relevance team and the work they do, or, or search science is our name for our relevance team. And Cassini is the tool that helps them get their job done. In the same way that Voyager was the tool that's been helping them get their job done for many years now. Um, and that sort of gets onto, you know, what will users see? Uh, we tried really hard to make this migration uh, transparent to our users. Uh, part of that was just management would freak out if I did things that made the experience very different when they're cutting over to Cassini. They wanted to understand that the platform itself is behaving well. And as a platform, you should be able to have it do different things, including more or less doing what we used to do. So one of the tests of the platform is, could we recreate most of the existing eBay user experience? Uh, we didn't go for 100% compatibility. We decided it was more useful to make sure we could have similar experiences or similar value 
but there are some decisions in the past we just wanted to be able to break away from in order to let us do new things. Um, now there is one case which uh, we actually did uh, take advantage of some of the Cassini new features and we have internally a name that we call it which is null and low which I think is completely meaningless to the rest of the universe but let me go ahead and explain it anyways because it's the easiest way to talk to other people in the company about it. Null and low is when users try to look for something and we have a really tough time looking for exactly what they asked for which means they get no results or they get few results. So instead of our normal ranking strategies, we try to back off and see, can we change their query a bit to sort of expand what might come back in the response without making it feel like we're just throwing random junk at them. Um, the Voyager system could not do one technique which we wanted to do is most people who search at eBay, they just search on the title. Uh, we have this whole other body of text called the description where these, the seller tells us more about the product. They also happen to tell us about themselves and other things they sell. So it's also a spamming opportunity which creates its own interesting problems. Uh, but there's this whole body of text that we wanted to leverage. Um, and you can actually do description searches at eBay today uh, because we actually have a Voyager implementation of that. The problem is that Voyager is optimized to treat all text equal. And the sellers have done an awful lot of work to make sure the titles are the most informative piece of the description of the product. So we wanted to make sure the title gets more weight than the rest of the description. Um, so Cassini allows us to do that. Now, in the overall search technology sphere, that's not a new thing. You know, web search engines and other search engines have been doing this kind of stuff for ages of treat some text as more important than others. Um, in the e-commerce universe of eBay, it turned out that in the early days, that didn't matter that much, but now it matters a lot to us. And the null and low case was the way we could do that, where we could secretly tap into the description data but still give more value to matches on the text. So that's the quote unquote null and low story. Um, now the other part which is sort of touching my comment about, this is also about a search business. Uh, that gets into things like total cost of ownership. Uh, it also gets into the fact that having a quote unquote world class search engine is a moving target. So, when I joined and we were talking about we need a new world-class search engine, that wasn't, well, just take all the current research and build that. It was that next year's research is going to be very different than this year's research, and we need to be able to keep on changing the system. So we did a lot of work on how can we change the system. And also understanding that our internal customers are going to be changing their expectations as well. Uh, so. Part of this presentation is going to touch into some of those stories about the business. Part of it's going to talk about classical search features. And again, please ask me questions, otherwise this will be really short. Um, oh, just sort of a personal note. For me, I don't think we finished 1.0 yet. Yes, we've had this nice public announcement. We've got a whole bunch of eBay.com running on Cassini. But we haven't yet done all of this stuff about accelerating the business. So for me, the justification for building this thing, spending a lot of engineer hours, a lot of money, et cetera, on building this engine is that it actually yields more value for our users and more value for our business. And when I start seeing that happening, then I know we nailed it for the 1.0 release. Yes? Uh, so can you give like one concrete example from a user's website user's perspective you know, what changed because of Cassini as opposed to Voyager? Because most of us are not internal to eBay, so we don't really know anything about it. Um, so the, the null and low experience is the only one so far where we've significantly changed the outcome of what users get using features that only exist in Cassini that we couldn't easily build with Voyager. So what is that? What is null and low? Uh, so that is where we, so if you're familiar with, uh, there's a common search ranking function called BM25F which means you can do differential scoring for text matches depending on where the text came from. So 
with uh, eBay, we have two main bodies of text. There's the title that the user gives us, and then there's the description. And we simply want to be able to use VM25F or our own internal variation of that as a way to rank documents. So in the past, with the Voyager kind of system, the way it was optimized, you could run VM25 but not VM25F. VM25 lets you do scoring based on uh, you have certain words in the query, how rare are those words in the collection of documents, the more rare words get higher scores. VM25F is do that same scoring system, but compute one score for the title, another score for the description, and then combine them together and give more value to the title score. Uh, so that's an oversimplification. If there's any relevance folks in here, they're probably cringing at the description I just gave you. Uh, but that's that's the gist of it in terms of what we tried to do with the null and low story. How big is that null and low? How frequently users see nothing? Mm -hmm. um, I think fraction of total search. So somewhere in the say ten to twenty percent range of the initial queries fall into that category. Now we do a lot of work to still produce something useful. So the in terms of a user still ending up with no results, uh, it's a single digit percentage, I forget what it is. Uh, but it's a significant fraction of the queries. And when we uh, implemented this, we tried to measure the business value. So we do a lot of data mining, because we're trying to be very data driven. And so this actually produced measurable benefit to the business, which we hope translates to measurable value to the users. Uh, there's we assume a certain correlation between if people are buying things, that means they're happy with the search experience. But we do also try to measure other successful outcomes that have nothing to do with buying something. Because we know people come to the site to do stuff other than simply buy things. I thought it was really interesting how you talked about you, you built this engine with, and, and in your building it, you have now have the, you built it with the ability so you could change it. So it could change to the needs of, of the users of the market. So what aspects of change did you build into it? Can you okay. say something about that? Uh, I have some slides that touch on aspects of that. So okay. they're, they're just a couple slides away. So as those pop up, then see if they invite more okay. questions and such. Um, so let me first talk about Classical search. So this is so I call search features are aspects of Cassini features that are visible through the queries language in terms of when I run a query, what kinds of things can I ask that query to do? Now this isn't you know the end user query directly. This is the search front end team and the relevance team. They take the, what you type in, they reformulate it, and they're trying to leverage a whole bunch of features off the search engine. What kind of features can they get at through the query language? And so that's what I think of as search features, which is the VM25 and VM25F kind of discussion, uh, different kinds of uh, selection criteria if you speak relational database. Uh, if I'm thinking about an e-commerce search engine, is we're half classical search engine, half relational database. And so we've actually constructed the query language that tries to marry the two worlds. Um, I'm guessing other folks have done that before, but that was really important, at least in terms of solving our kinds of problems, uh, to allow our internal people to speak to us in both those kinds of languages. Um, and then, sort of, there's all the other stuff we do, I'm not sure what to call them, so they're not search features or something like that. Um, but some of the classical search features stuff, um, we talked already about title and description and being able to treat matches in one as more important than matches in another. Uh, we also have, uh, actually, so I've got a little side note here about, um, one of the things that allowed us to make the transition from Voyager to Cassini uh, transparent for our users was, we actually created the Cassini indexes to have full title and description. But the current primary use case in terms of what our users are doing is title only search. So that specific feature was very important in terms of making a graceful transition in that we wanted to inject all this extra data into the system, but not have it accidentally change the user behavior. We wanted to selectively 
pick which queries will start mining into that extra data to change the, uh, what we're returning to our users. Uh, and so that's what you're going to see over time as we're going to selectively start leveraging this extra data. We're not simply going to blast it all on and create crazy experiences. Uh, we already know that if we simply turn it on, you'd get all sorts of strange things happening. As I mentioned, uh, a lot of our sellers uh, treat the description as a chance to spam us. Or a lot of it's not intentional. It's just the description is where the seller gets to tell their story. It's not just the story of the product. It's the story of the seller. And one of our challenges is, is separating those two pieces out. Because when somebody's searching on something, usually they're searching on aspects of the product. We still need aspects of the seller. Usually we try to factor that into ranking in terms of sellers with good reputations and such. One assumes that buyers have a certain preference for that. Not always. Uh, there are scenarios where the reverse is true. But, uh, we're trying to pick this data and use it in different ways. So we still have a challenge of converting those stories into meaningful pieces of information to, to use in the search engine. Um, there's, now I talked about title and description. Uh, some search engines treat those as separate buckets of text. Uh, some search engines also have the notion of fields. Uh, if you go to a typical web search engine, you can say uh, URL colon, you know, match a piece of the URL, or site colon, you know, match this string against the name of the site, a whole bunch of features like that. Well, that's something we've added to. Uh, it's sort of existed in the Voyager platform already, but wasn't fully leveraged. We tried to make it a stronger concept. Um, we're using it for both ranking and recall, in that you can use it to say, I only want things that match a word in one of these fields. Uh, fields mean different things to different people. There's no industry standard language that I'm aware of for how to describe search engine features. So we just made things up as we go to some extent. Um, but typically what you'll see as a field kind of thing is if you're using some other search engine and you say something colon and then a word, that's usually treated as a field search saying that you want to match this only in a piece of the document. Um, we allow lots of different ways of slicing and dicing a document. You can segregate them into separate pieces. You can create overlapping pieces. Um, some things that web search engines will do is they'll, they might say match text in the H1 headers, and a web page will have many H1 headers scattered across the document. And so fields can be disjoint, scattered across the document. Um, you can also have fields like author, which is one of the examples I have here. Uh, so author, you might also subdivide into first name and last name. Uh, another thing on uh, author, which uh, Madonna, the Madonna query comes up because many, many years ago when I was uh, doing a multimedia search with uh, Alta Vista and Bing, um, the name of an artist was a challenge because if people are searching for Madonna, or Black Madonna, they expect very different results. Uh, so sometimes it's important to say, does, is the artist field only have the word Madonna as opposed to does it simply contain the word Madonna? So we support that kind of stuff too. Essentially we're just trying to build a search engine platform that has a lot of the common pieces that you see out there and offer those pieces up to the search front end and search science teams to then create new uh, user experiences. So this is really focused on a generic search engine platform. We have optimizations for e-commerce. The idea was, I don't know what features next year that exist in the general search space might turn into really hot things for e-commerce. So let's just build a general platform to easily accommodate those kinds of things. Um, Multi-round ranking is also another classical kind of thing that a lot of search engines do. Um, a lot of that actually, in some ways, is not so much about the user experience. It's more about managing the cost of, the, of executing queries. And that you can't have the really, really good rank functions are really, really expensive. So you can't afford to score every single document that matches the query using that really, really expensive thing. So you first use a lightweight scoring function. 
sort of filter out the wheat from the chaff, and then run the really expensive scoring function on the wheat. That's a classical approach, a lot of search engines are doing it. So let's you know, throw it in the mix. Yes? Uh, you also store the position information so I can search for Yes, we, yeah. yes, when we index a document, we, we maintain all the word position information. Uh, you can play tricks such as superimposing multiple words in the same word position. A lot of sort of the classical search features there. And so leaping into the other side of the universe, what are the not search features? Um, there's the total cost of ownership story. Um, one of the cost puzzles is how much human involvement does it take to run a search engine. Um, and there's some dimensions of just sort of what's the daily cost of running a search engine. There's also the fact that when things go wrong, you need to sometimes get humans in the loop. We also want to sort of reduce the pressure. Uh, we're a 24-7 site, just like a lot of other internet search engines. That means we have to have pagers. Now, fortunately, eBay is a place willing to invest engineering dollars to reduce the probability that those pagers will go off. So that's one of the things we're trying to do with the Cassini project, is make sure we build a system so that we don't have to wake up too many people, or at least not too often. Uh, there's some folks in the room who have experienced getting woken up. <laughs> so uh, they're very eager to make sure we follow through on this uh, promise of a design. And another thing that's also getting to sort of the part, starting to touch on the notion that things change. Uh, it's one thing to simply add a bunch of new features and use those to create a you know, better user experience. Um, it's a whole other thing of how fast can we add new features. And so my sort of classic uh, example of talking about uh, experiments that the relevance team has to do or search science team has to do do we have search science folks here? <coughs> uh, I want to be careful about insulting them. Okay. Uh, I apologize in advance. Uh, so, they're really bright people, but they don't always know what's going to work. So, they need to try things out. And so, I have an overly simplistic mental model of what it means to generate more revenues. Uh, we might have 10 ideas we want to try. Uh, any one of those ideas has the potential of generating a 1% increase in profit or revenue, um, but only four of them are going to actually pay off, and the other six will turn out not to work. So the rate at which we can grow in terms of revenue or grow in terms of improving user experience is how many times can I cycle through batches of 10 experiments? And so that's part of what we try to think of from an engineering perspective of designing this system is make it so that we can run more of those experiments so that the search science team and other folks have a chance to try out more ideas and that translates to more revenue. If I can go from say 50 experiments a year, I'm not sure what the actual number is, I'm making that up so don't quote me in terms of how, how our experimentation system works. Uh, but you know, hypothetically, if I could go from 50 experiments a year to 200 experiments a year, that's an opportunity to increase our revenue growth rate by a factor of four. <coughs> so there's real value in looking at this part of the engineering puzzle, not just what are the search features, but how do I change how I'm using them. Oh, I thought I saw a question, hand go up there. Um, so let me move forward. Uh, so one of the things that we try to deal with is uh, changing data and changing queries. So historically, uh, the way that we and actually a lot of folks try to experiment is the user types in something, let me change the way we think about what the user typed in. And so we'll try all sorts of ways of guessing what's the category or other things about that, oh, did they, are there synonyms that make sense, uh, stemming, you know, all sorts of things like that. We try to come up with different ways of changing the query around to better grasp what the user's intent was. And the Voyager system was good at allowing us to change the queries, but in terms of thinking about what is it cost to run the search engine, 
that's not always the best way to have a good cost story. So part of what the search platform team has to also pay attention to is what's the cost per query. So we have to try to change the balance between doing all of our effort through changing queries versus changing what's in the index. Now, changing what's in the index uh, is inherently a slower thing to do, uh, in part because if I want to add new data to the index, that right away translates to buying more hardware, even if it's going to turn out that that new data doesn't help us. The nice thing about trying new queries is I can try them a little bit. Yeah, we spend more CPU time while we're running that experiment, but as soon as we decide that it was a bad idea, we turn it off, and we get back our, our CPU capacity. So from a hardware budget management perspective, playing the query game is a lot easier than playing the index uh, expansion game. Uh, but in terms of fidelity of user experience, index expansion offers a lot more opportunity. When you think about things like synonym expansion, uh, context, gives you a lot of value in terms of knowing what's the actual meaning, how many variations of that word are actually meaningful. Uh, you know, if, if puppy is the name of the band, then don't bother also expanding it to dog, things like that. That's really hard to do in the query. You know, if all you see is puppy, you don't know what the heck's going on, we have to try all the different variations. But in the document, if we know this is about piece of music or some fan art or something like that, we can change how we think about expansions. So it offers a lot of opportunity for better value for our users, but it is more painful for an organization to deal with that. So we've tried to change the story about how fast we can change the data in the system <coughs> so that it's easier to add new data. Uh, and this is one of the limitations, unfortunately, that Voyager system had, which was was optimized for real time, as in all updates are organic coming from uh, our sellers out there. And as we started doing a lot more updates internally, which tend to be sort of a little bit more batchy, say, oh, I've got some new idea. I need to change the 500 million items we've got in our system to have this new piece of data. That gets a little bit more painful when you're trying to do it all through a, a system designed to just keep up with organic updates. So we changed the story. We've, we've optimized to, to be able to do bulk changes to the system, but still maintaining the, the real-time updates that our sellers expect, and also that our ranking team expects, and that as we learn stuff about items, we need to update the data fast. Um, our life cycle of a document is, is much shorter than the life cycle of a web document in a web search engine. So web search engines, for most of their collection, have a long history that they can accumulate of user behavior to feed back into. We have products that can come and go in a day. It's really hard to have a product stay there long enough to collect user feedback. So as we start learning about something, we need to get it back into the system really fast. So we have to maintain that sort of balance between being fresh, and, uh, and actually I'm not sure what I'm talking about anymore. Uh, sorry, I tend to ramble a little bit sometimes. Uh, so I don't know how to finish that sentence, so let me cut off that sentence and start with another one. Um, and so I'm talking about Cassini, we, you know, improving the rate of change, but it's still easier to change queries. That's just the fundamental truth of search engines. So some of getting that right balance on the cost per query or more value to our users is just a matter of internal discipline. I, I don't know how to completely solve that problem with technology. Um, and part of what I was describing about the kinds of changes we make to the index, I tend to call those two different categories of data. There's content freshness in terms of keeping up with the content that our sellers are providing us. And then there's what I call algorithmic freshness which is we use algorithms to interpret that data and we capture those, that, those interpretations and write them back into the index. And we, as we update those algorithms, we need to make sure that that aspect of the system is fresh. Um, and here's my one bullet point to Hadoop. Uh, I wasn't 
planning on talking a, a lot about Hadoop, but I'm happy if people have questions about it. Uh, I'm not sure if Thomas is happy or not that I'm not going to talk a lot about Hadoop, but I think Thomas has presented before about our Hadoop story. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so, um, so talk to him. <laughs> uh, he's one of our Hadoop experts in house. Uh, so let me move on to another story. So I'm sort of going from vignette to vignette here. So feel free to dive in any time. Was bid price part of the index? Was bid price? Bid price? Of the item, which constantly keeps on changing, right? Yes. Was it part of the index? It's part of the index. Um, it's in that, well, I won't go into exactly how we use it in ranking, but it's, it's an interesting feature in ranking in terms of what's the current price. Uh, how much interest is there in the item that's for an auction? Updates is a updates is a big challenge in the inventory index, right? Like, uh, and because we have to the segment mergers and all the, all, all those things that need to happen as part of updating the feed, right? Like, so uh, I'm like, can you can you give us some knowledge of what you do? Uh, yeah, updating posting lists is fundamentally a pain in the butt. Um, so what we try to do is um, relational database style updates are much easier to sort of do in place. Uh, whenever you're updating a posting list, you typically have, you either have the choice of ripping up the posting list and repacking it, or you do, we do a lot of what a lot of other folks do, is they just mark the old document as please ignore, and they just add a new copy. So we do a fair amount of that too. So. If there's a posting list update, the cost of adding that update is higher. Uh, we end up with more dead space in our query servers. That increases the cost a bit. Um, but posting lists are very valuable in terms of uh, query execution speed. So we always do a little bit of a trade-off. Some updates are frequent enough. I'm going to treat them as a relational database kind of update but I won't be able to use that data in the same performant way as if I had encoded in the posting list. So, um, The challenge is, uh, so if you're doing in-place update, right, you're assuming that it's a, it's a limited field, size of the field is constant, right? Uh, literally in place in terms of the price is two or four bytes, yes. Okay, this, so, you, um, okay, so basically the idea is to preserve a bigger space and for in-place updates and basically use that extra space for potentially <coughs> bigger data size updates as well. Um, yeah, you, you could say that the update story for search engines is an interesting garbage collection and fragmentation story. So um, relational database kind of updates, even if they're variable length, have a better garbage collection story than posting list updates. So we sort of have a spectrum of knobs we can twist in terms of pre-allocating space for some things versus uh, the cost of some kinds of updates versus how it affects uh, the query performance. Uh, let's see, so my next theme. Um, I'm not sure who else believes this, but I, I think of innovation as a deadly weapon. Uh, it's, you might say, sort of like handing a room full of kids a bunch of sharp sticks and, and letting them run around. Uh, though actually we have very smart kids around here, so... Uh, but uh, there's a lot of unintended consequences sometimes from people trying out good ideas. And so we have a lot of people building on top of the search platform. This isn't some little small startup where uh, there's a few folks down the row who are doing all the front end work or doing all this search science work. Uh, we have hundreds of people across the company trying to build things on top of the search engine. And we're trying to expand not only the number of people who are doing that work, but also how fast they can try out things. So we have a really big playground, you might say, and part of what I need to do is uh, put little safety nets in place and things like that so that uh, they can innovate faster without killing each other or, or without killing the stuff I just built. So, uh, so part of it is uh, enlightened self-interest. Uh, 
uh, hate getting phone calls in the middle of the night saying, uh, your infrastructure blew up, uh, what are you going to do about it? Uh, I also had getting phone calls in the middle of the night where uh, the team that's focusing on uh, motor search is saying, uh, for some reason our stuff is failing, we, we didn't change anything, and then it turns out somebody somewhere else happened to change something and they happened to gobble up some resource that was really important to the motors team. Um, so part of my, or our engineering challenge was how do we create a world where all these people can move faster uh, but keep the system safe. Um, when I was in working in the web search space, uh, we typically had silos for these different teams and they were typically separate server farms. Uh, one of the good or bad things about working in the web search space is uh, web search engines often have verticals, you know, you're searching for news, searching for images, videos, and each of those tended to have different uh, sets of servers. And usually what happened was uh, the web search, actually searching for web documents, was the 800-pound gorilla. Everybody, they got to design the software, and everybody else got to do a copy and paste off of that and go off <coughs> on their own world. We don't have that kind of universe. There isn't one 800-pound gorilla who's driving uh, the features that, that we need to provide. We have lots of small vertical teams. We also have sort of a graduated search experience where people might be starting off with broad queries and slowly refining them. And it's hard to pick a point along that progression where you're going from general to specific. So it's a lot easier for us if we can keep all that information that all those teams are using in one search index so we can create that graduated experience. But it does mean that they're all competing for the same hardware resources, uh, both in terms of doing good work and also in terms of making mistakes. So it's possible for one team to make a mistake and it impacts a whole bunch of other teams. So we need to put in protection. We can't do the hardware siloing, so we do software siloing. This is one of our works in progress is trying to come a better story of how do we guarantee, keep our promises to those different teams saying, you, you described you wanted to build something for our users, you need a certain amount of capacity from us, how do we keep, make sure that you get that capacity from us? Um, and so that also affects uh, speed. Now I, I tried to add one last bullet point here to say, well, no, I'm not ranting against the people uh, that are using our system. Um, a lot of people, you know, a lot of folks here are trying to be really careful, um, but in a system that doesn't have a safety net, there's a lot of ambiguity about what's the impact of making a change, which means they move slower. They tend to be a lot more cautious. So. Part of the safety net is not just protection, it's also giving them a lot more faith that they can move faster without you know, mangling the, the whole setup. If they only have to worry about, well, I screw up my 10% of eBay.com instead of screwing up all of eBay.com, uh, it's a, it's a hopefully a, uh, helps them to sleep at night. My next thing. Um, so another interesting challenge that I'm not sure how much of it is eBay specific or other search engines sort of dealing with this is um, we have a, a thing where we try to make it really easy for people to build custom experiences using the search engine. Uh, so Voyager had, had a capability to create what I call schema silos, which means even though they're in a shared index, Different collections of documents can have a different schema in terms of containing different data that's specific to that use case. Um, we were so flexible about it that it's hard to keep up with what did the people actually do. Um, and so here I'm talking about this going you know, from flexible to laissez-faire to indifference. Uh, what we're aiming for in terms of having a productive uh, experience within the company is somewhere in the laissez-faire zone. And that yes, you get to make a lot of your own decisions, but you're also making commitments to other teams saying, I'm putting this data in the index, you can count on this data being there and looking this way. 
We're not going to pull the rug out from under you. And letting the software itself inform you of those decisions in terms of what's there and what's not there. Right now, a lot of those kinds of conversations about what's in the system are managed outside the system. Uh, and if you want to be nimble, it's a lot easier when the system itself informs you about what's there. So that's another sort of business kind of shift in terms of how we're uh, pushing changes in the, uh, our engineering processes and the uh, system architecture. Um, let's see. Now, the, another interesting challenge uh, about the siloing comes with the progression from broad search to narrow search. Um, we, we've been spending a lot of effort recently to improve our ranking functions in terms of looking for more signals in the data so that we can make better predictions about what our users actually want. Uh, if there isn't a clear description of the data in the index, it's very hard for the ranking functions to understand the value of those signals. Also, if the signals are constantly changing because there's no commitment behind what they mean, then what looked like a good ranking function today might fail miserably some months from now. So we're trying to shift the balance from everybody focusing on their silos to looking at the bigger story. Um, and I think we're still kind of wrestling with what's the, the sweet spot on that. Uh, but we're pushing really hard to change the, the center of gravity on being clear about what's there uh, and so sort of specifying what you're doing, which some people think of as a way of slowing things down, I think the net outcome actually is people can go faster. Uh, I compare this in some ways to the debate between C and Java. Uh, a lot of people complain that Java is too restrictive, but if you look out there, it's easy to say that Java programmers are many times, a lot of times more productive than C programmers because the tighter constraints of the programming language actually allow you to move faster. So there's a similar kind of balance we're trying to strike with the search engine technology between too much flexibility, which people think they want to move fast, versus something that's tighter that actually lets you move fast because you don't have to constantly second guess what happened. Um, and I think I sort of leaked into the last section here about communicating the decisions and commitments. Um, I, again, it's, it's a lot. The, if there's nothing necessarily wrong with having discussions about what's in the index outside of the system, but there's no way to leverage the system to test to see what's actually there. So that's why we're trying to bring the notion of data contracts and that kind of stuff into the system. Uh, it also helps a lot with uh, uh, testing in terms of if the software itself understands the, the contract, understands the promises you made, it's a lot easier to see, I'm about to release this new piece of software, let me test it against the contract, see if my assumptions about what's there are correct. Uh, if you don't do that kind of stuff, you tend to get into a lot of failure, what we call silent failure modes. Uh, it's hard for, when you have gobs of optional data, which is the side effect of having different schemas, um, it's very hard for a system to differentiate between data that doesn't exist for some of your documents versus data that will never exist because you simply misspelled the name of it. Uh, we're trying to catch those mistakes about misspelling the name of price. You know, if you spell price with an S instead of a C, uh, depending on how you set up your system, you will never know that you made, your mistake, made that mistake. We're trying to capture those simple mistakes, but still allow people to have some of these buckets of for really dynamic data. Uh, the state of the internet today is tagging and things like that. Uh, it's a very important concept, which means you have very fluid data. We need to support that too. So we'll never be a pure, strict schema kind of universe. We're simply moving the balance there. And let's see. Okay, just an FYI, I've only got two or three more slides, so uh, feel free to slow me down. Um, so another thing about is uh, bugs. Uh, bugs happen, uh, even with the work we're doing to make it easier to test your stuff, 
uh, they still leak in. So we need to create some layers of defense around the bugs. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question on the posting list. Uh -huh. So what decisions uh, or what influenced the design of the posting list? Was it compressed? What was the ordering? And the various ways of sorting the fields within a posting list as well uh, that might impact quality as well as efficiency. Um, so we followed a pretty conventional notion about sorting a posting list in that all our posting lists are sorted in document order. So we sequence the documents in a certain order and all the posting lists have that order. Uh, some search engines use what might be called impact ordering. Um, impact ordering is very useful for certain classes of rank functions. It tends to bias you to, you can only sort your queries one way. You can only have one rank function because uh, the impact ordering forces you to do pruning. Um, so I'm getting into sort of low level search engine design stuff here. So search engines and query processing engine have the notion of an accumulator, which is sort of a, a working set of what documents so far match the query. I only want to return the most relevant ones, so I've got an accumulator that tries to keep track of the most relevant documents. Um, with a document ordered posting lists, what I can do is I can take a document, I can score it, and put it in my accumulator. Each new document I consider, I can say, does this belong in my accumulator or not? We typically have sort of a cutoff score of, I only want to keep the top 100 results, so whatever is the score of the 100th result is my threshold for not anything else goes in there. So document ordering, in some document order posting lists, in some ways, it's less efficient than impact ordering posting lists, but it's agnostic to what your rank function is. Correct. I, with the system we're running, we can have ten different rank functions which have very different ideas of what are the important signals. Uh, with impact ordering. You're pre-committing to the importance of your signals. You're actually sorting your posting list by the signal values, and keeping your accumulator small is tightly coupled to those choices. Okay. If I want to run multiple rank functions, I essentially would have to keep uh, multiple posting lists, each optimized for the different rank function. So now that's. I'm probably exaggerating a bit, but that I'm trying to sort of emphasize the distinction between different choices around optimizations that people do. Uh, you can make a similar discussion about um, how do you partition documents across servers? Because yeah, no one server in our system can hold all the documents. Um, a lot of the research out there says uh, you can get better query performance if you do what's called term partitioning instead of document partitioning. So I say this one server is going to have all the posting list entries for the word doc. So whereas if we do document partitioning where everything about a document is in one server, and I've got some millions of documents there, the next server has the next millions of documents. If I'm looking for dog, I have to ask all the servers that have part of my index, do you have something that matches dog? So the minimum entry cost of running a query is higher with document partitioning rather than term partitioning. Um, but term partitioning has crazier performance characteristics as your queries get more complicated. Um, you can think of a multi-word query as doing a join across all the words. In term partitioning, you're doing your join over the network. Right. Uh, with document partitioning, the join is in the box. You're only forwarding to what we call the aggregation layer, uh, the best matches out of that box. So yes, we're, we don't have the lowest cost story for simple queries. But for mid-range and expensive, we got a much better overall story. It also means that the predictability of our workloads is a little bit better. Because uh, the low and upper bound is much, are closer together with what we've done than what a lot of the research papers talk about. So, 
Thanks for giving me something that wasn't in my presentation so I could stretch this out. I'm happy to dive into these other sort of crazy topics. Uh, actually, that's not a crazy topic, but I don't know how many people worry about those things. Uh, so, operating with design choices, we're optimizing for wheelchair and like the expensive gear, or we're optimizing for common case, or like some of, uh, some of your implementation decisions are functional. What you're optimizing for, right? So, like, uh, I mean, what, what, were your, what were some of your design decisions? Um, I think you just hit it, right? So, you're saying that you're optimizing, not optimizing for single token buys, but you're optimizing for. Yeah, and, and with e commerce kind of. Is that design philosophy? Or? Well, it, uh, a lot of people talk about the average user query is two point something words or something like that. Um, with an e-commerce kind of interface and, and sometimes with some web search interfaces, the words they type in is not the only input. We have this left rail, which some of we call the aspects or the things you can pick, categories you can pick. You know, if you drill down into something, of, you know, a product that has the concept of size or color, there's lots of different things you can pick. Those are all extra words in the query. So even before it gets to the back end, what people describe as a two or three word query is already a 10 word query. Then we go through the layers of oh, synonym expansion, oh, we think you're talking about this category of products, so let me search for that category, not just your name of the category, all sorts of things like that. Uh, as you end up with a query that could be tens or even hundreds of terms. Uh, and so at that point, you know, the notion of term-based partitioning and the, the value you get from it is just totally blown out the window. So it wasn't even worth considering. Uh, because those kind of stuff are literally about the small number of word queries. Uh, now, I've heard reports, I've carefully avoided verifying it, that we've managed to create queries that are megabyte in size. So we've had things where you can get really, really enthusiastic about between uh, somebody on the front end side trying to capture all that, all the, what the user's trying to talk about, to then going to the relevant side, trying to reinterpret all the things that we think the user's talking about, to other kinds of things where we sometimes have you know, hidden reasons for doing some kinds of expansion things. Uh, if you're not careful, those things can run amok. And we have seen some edge cases that look pretty scary. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to create a system where those giant queries could be a lot shorter if we simply enrich the data that's in the index. Uh, some of that simply reflects the frustration of people inside the company trying to say, I know what the user's telling me. You know, how can I get the search engine to give me those results? Uh, let's see. Oh, I was talking about bugs. Yeah, I know. Nobody has bugs. But um, we have to build some lines of defense around that. Because uh, since we're asking people to move faster, we're saying we're happy to have more people inside the company using our search engine. The bugs per day that are hitting the site will go up. That's just a fact of life. So we're trying to create layers of defenses around that. Some of that is. Um, historically, we've relied on the core of the system to have some defensive layers in terms of detecting malformed queries, things like that. But a lot of the stuff sort of flows through a lot of the stack before we actually find out that what you sent us just doesn't make sense. So we've changed the contract in terms of how we talk to the uh, query system to move that out to the edges. And one of the things we did, which um, this broke with some of the traditions we had here before and, and exist in other companies, is we do not have a wire protocol. So in terms of a wire protocol that we publish to other teams saying, here, just write something according to this wire protocol. In other words, we don't, we don't want people writing HTTP URLs to send queries to our system. Instead, we're insisting that you use a library that we provide that will compose the queries for you and send them over the wire. That sounds backwards to you know some of the 
policies around how do you construct layers of services and that kind of stuff. But it does give us a lot better protection of the system. Uh, it means that the client library can check to see uh, is your query well composed. You know, we get some people think classic mistakes, so they have unbalanced parentheses and things like that. Uh, we we try to make that whole problem space simply not exist. Uh, I mentioned before about what happens if somebody misspells price. They spell with an S instead of a C. We can do those kinds of detections at the client side. Uh, so. And the nice thing about that is that the client gets an immediate signal about there's something wrong. Uh, sometimes some of these errors can flow through in sort of a silent failure mode. The price one is an example. And we end up getting a phone call saying, you know, my results look kind of weird. I thought I put in, I thought I decided to put in this thing for users where I would search for prices between ten and a hundred dollars, and just isn't quite giving me the results I want. And then we have to go grinding through log files and other things, and we finally figure, oh, we didn't spell it right. So if we change some of the contracts, then they can find out right away that that's a problem. Their system gets a signal instead of it being a general search platform signal that something's not quite right. Um, so, so even though it's unconventional, we believe that the library approach of hiding the wire protocol allowing us to embed some of our business logic and some of our control logic into the client application gives us a better overall story for the company. Um, let's see, oh, just the, the QA thing I talked about a little bit about that before too. Um, the fact that there's a lot of client-side enforcement or validation available also means it's possible to test your code without having to have a copy of the search engine running to talk to, to to check to see if you're doing the right thing. Now you still need to do that for some of your testing, but a certain class of test suites can now be finished purely with instantiating your client. And that's a good savings for our internal customers because spinning up a whole search stack is non-trivial. Uh, and so we're just sort of removing that from the cost of the, of the people trying to be able to test their applications so that hopefully makes them more nimble. Um, and mentioned sort of you know, layers. So okay, stuff will still get through. Um, talked before about hardware silos versus software silos. Software silos also offers sort of a layer of defense in that we have a silo of capacity. Even though it's a shared set of servers, you get this capacity. You might end up running out of capacity because you made a mistake where you're suddenly sending us queries a lot more expensive than you thought they would be. And we won't quite shut you down. You know, if we have capacity in the system, you get to use the excess capacity. If we're running out of that capacity, then we're going to start doing a triage process where roughly the idea is that you want the highest number of queries to succeed because we think that roughly correlates with keeping the most users happy in a bad situation. And worry when the meeting manager starts jumping around. <laughs> um, sorry about the distraction. Um, and so that gets into sort of these load shell shedding kinds of things that we also have to build in the system. So we have a multi-layer defense system that we follow here. Can you give a little details? Was, is, is it like one search cluster or for all the verticals and for the eBay core eBay? Is it one search cluster that's doing the job, or? Uh, we, do have, we do have multiple clusters for clearly distinct categories. So where the content is different, uh, you know, if you've got a, a bunch of information about users that you want to be able to search on, that's clearly different than products for sale or, or listings of things for sale. So those are obvious. You just put them on a separate cluster. Um, we tried really hard to decouple uh, capacity planning from um, whether or not you can only have a whole, whether or not you have a whole bunch of users on one sort of cluster. So um, we have the notion that a single server could have multiple tables or indexes on it. So if you have a lot of small use cases, 
we're not going to force you to set up new ser servers each for each use case. We, you can actually co-locate them, even though they're they're very distinct in that, in that one query won't ever touch both. Uh, and that's just sort of you know just layering of architecture, planning for the future. I want to decouple the different pressure points around growth. Uh, also, it's a lot easier to manage fewer machines than more. Um, so that, those kinds of things are built into the system. I'm not sure that's quite answering your question. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was like, you know, uh, some details about like sharding. Do you guys happen to share get sharding? Uh, yes, we do sharding. Uh, well, there's the the most simplistic problem, which is we can't fit all our documents on a single server. So by definition, we have to shard. So uh, when the query happens, you're basically sending the request. You're broadcasting the request to each and every server, or kind of doing some probabilistic uh, um, selection of the servers you want to query upon? Well, we do the classic thing a lot of other folks do, which is we divide up our content and notion of rows and columns. So um, if, let's say, I, I can fit 20 million documents on a server, and I've got 2 billion documents, uh, that's 100 servers. <laughs> um, so 100 shards, uh, and yes, so it takes 100 shards to have a full copy of the index, or, or 100 servers, you might say, and we call that a row. Uh, and so that one query has to go to eat to 100 different servers. Now for each of those servers can handle a certain amount of queries per second, so if we've got a lot more, we need to add more of these rows. Uh, we also add some extra capacity to deal with the fact that machines die and other things like that happen. Uh, we also intentionally take machines down in terms of if we're deploying new software, we have to temporarily take it out of service. So, um, Do you guys use any tricks for uh, for kind of saving in the hardware capacity to figure out, uh, like, you know, querying specific shards, for instance, and then, like, global shard? Um, there so are... Do use, like, some browsers take... Uh, approach for figuring out, like, hey, these are, uh, for example, right, electronics could be potentially on, like, if you kind of uh, add a category and then sharp abstraction, you can potentially save some capacity by specifically. So, we're running a mostly RAM resident kind of system. Uh, back when I was at AltaVista, we were running a hybrid model. Of part of the index was in RAM and part of the index was on disk. And typically with those kinds of systems, what you do is you optimize for some posting lists are in RAM and some are on you know, disk. The quote unquote relational data, which is sometimes called doc data, those typically have to be RAM resident. Um, so in those kinds of hybrid memory systems, you can play some tricks saying, I will look at the terms of the query and I might pick say the first word of the query as a way of deciding which row of servers to go to because what that will let me do is I can have the RAM on each row optimized to have different sets of posting lists uh, memory resident instead of on disk. And so you can do those kinds of games to reduce the overall paging rate of your cluster as a whole. Uh, but those kinds of strategies kind of went away with, when a lot of search engines went to purely RAM based. Um, the Introduction of SSDs create the opportunity to go back to hybrid. I don't know if we ever will. Uh, there's a interesting problem that RAM is it doesn't cost a lot to have at least a, a decent amount of RAM on a box, and we, along with many other search engines, find that the cost of running a query in terms of how long you have to wait for the results is proportional to the number of documents that match a query. You know, nothing too radical about that. Um, but the pressure from the website, from the, our website saying, searches need to be faster and faster because we want to get stuff back to our users really, really fast, means we got a lot of pressure to have fewer documents per server because if you have fewer documents, then the number of documents that match a query goes down, which means the latency goes down. And I don't know if, if the cost of hardware is going to allow us to have small enough amount of RAM per server, 
but have an index that's bigger than that to justify going to hybrid memory model. Because uh, so you can think of it that, it, it may be that the way to get there is you don't think about taking a server with a lot of RAM and then adding some SSDs. Because if I add a bigger index, let's say I double my index size, that means I'm doubling my latency. And there are certain people, especially on the front end side, who really hate it when I slow down the queries. Um, so you might say, oh, well, actually, let's, let's run that equation in reverse. Instead of expanding my index, let me hold the index size constant, but shrink the RAM, and therefore force some of it onto the disk. Um, I could do that, but I don't know if that's actually going to reduce the, my cost of the server. You know, going from, say, 64 gig of RAM to 32 gig of RAM per server might not be interesting enough to give me a cost savings. So why am I complicating my story for a hypothetical cost savings? So I don't know where Gushy's going to land. land. Uh, fortunately, our scale is big enough that we're working with folks like Dell and HP about trying to discover what is the right sort of motherboard for running a search engine. And they're happy to work with us. Now, folks like Google, they design their own motherboards. You know, they're big enough scale that they can do that. We're not quite to the point where we really want to design our own motherboards, but fortunately the hardware vendors are happy to work with us and say, help us learn what's the right kind of motherboard for a search engine. So we're going down these paths trying to figure out that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know if we'll ever go back to the old world of hybrid memory models. It was fun back in, in the 1990s. <laughs> so when you're creating these charts, right? So, uh, are you going to be retrieving like a similar recall set? Like, uh, uh, we're going to be, so let's say you have 10 shots, right? We're going to be saying, like, you know, for the next ranking algorithm, you want to get like 1,000 or 2,000 dogs, right? So are you going to be saying, A hey, shot one, uh, give me a 10 dogs from shot one? Are you, are you, are you assuming a uniform distribution of documents across all the shards? And you're uh, kind of, uh, you know, how does the federation and aggregation uh, work at a um, level? We, like most search engines in the, in, in the document partitioning kind of world, you try really hard to avoid hotspots. So we try to intentionally randomize the distribution of the documents. Uh, and generally, we're, it's pretty successful. So the law of large numbers kind of just, so yeah, it just sort of works. Uh, so, um, so, you know, we, we assume even distribution, is, I'm sorry, I missed the other part of your question in terms so of... So you have a query uh, iPhone, now that you've got to search for like 10 shots. And uh, you are you, so are you going to be assuming that the iPhone can be spread equally across 10 shots, right? That's the assumption you're working with, right? Um, I don't know, I mean, that's, so, uh, you know, so the thing is... Yeah, so... Different people tend to go with different set of assumptions. I was wondering what you would do as a design decision. Well, there's, there's complicating factors to that. So yes, we assume the raw content is roughly uniformly distributed. And so you say, oh, um, I, wanna, I want 200 results. I got 10 shards. I'll simply ask each shard for 20 results. You don't trust true uniform distribution. So you say, oh, let me ask for 22 or 25 or 30 maybe. Uh, but then somebody, in the, usually the search front end people cause these kinds of problems, they say, you know, I asked you for all this stuff, but what I want you to do is, if you see things that are kind of similar, only show one of them. We call that deduping. A lot of search engines do it. You know, in the web search, you'll see that in what's called site collapse. They try really hard to only show you a few results from a single website. So the core search engine might have spewed out you know, 500 of the first thousand results were all from the same website, and then they have to throw a bunch of them away. Well, that whole thing of um, do I over ask for that ideal 20 per server and go to 25, the deduping ratio just sort of screws up that whole thing. So you end up in a whole other universe of trying to predict what's your duplication rate. And there is no universal duplication rate because it depends on when we're trying to do things around having a diversity of results and we don't want you to see too much of the same thing. Well, for one category of products, what 
is a duplicate might be different than another category of products, or the rate of duplication in terms of how many people are trying to sell the same thing. Um, so it makes it really hard for us to figure that kind of stuff out. I don't know how to give you sort of a, a, a trivial answer to that. So it, it means that over-asking, the query knows for how much you produce, is actually a really tough problem. Uh, because if I over-ask too enthusiastically, I'm just throwing a lot of uh, CPU capacity on the floor. So I ask for a lot of stuff, I throw a lot of it away, that's not a good story. Because the other question is, uh, uh, the shard has got its own TFID, right? And it's a global TFID that you're not computing when you're sharding, you know, when you're sharding, right? And, and uh, most of this uh, IR ranking principles rely on the TFID of scores. Mm -hmm. right? So, uh, I mean, what are some design decisions you kind of talk like, uh, you were saying that, hey, the documents are informally distributed, so uh, the local TFID is as good as the like, global TFID, for instance? Um. Local versus global TFIDF breaks down on tail queries, or queries that have low result counts. Uh, and so, yes, we might have sort of uniform distribution, but if you've got, say, 100 shards, and there's only 300 results from that query, you're not going to get three results from every shard. And so, yes, you do need to play games around normalizing the uh, document frequency aspect of TFIDF. Um, so there's some things around that that we're trying to deal with in terms of how important is it for our rank functions. Because uh, TFIDF is only one piece of, a, of a, an e-commerce kind of rank function, so a lot of other signals that go in there. Uh, so we try to figure out, okay, what's the value of getting this really right instead of approximately right? Um, also, um, we've tried to design the system so that um, what we put in the index doesn't have to literally be TFIDF. Um, there are lots of kinds of data similar to that, and why don't we just, if, if we've got a different story that's better than that, let's go ahead and cook that into the index. So uh, we've tried really hard not to hardwire the concept of TFIDF as a scoring function. Uh, it's more that there are certain characteristics of documents where you want to attach a score to a word, which is essentially term frequency, uh, in terms of the score for that word in that document. You want to have the notion of a score for a word across all documents, which is document frequency. So let's just have a system that allows you to manipulate those two concepts of assigning scores to terms in different scopes. You not literally worry about TFID. <coughs> I want to step back to the DJU issue you were just talking about. Um, it seems to me that the DJU would be more suited on the front end to allow the front end side rather than back end. Is that true or not true? Because um, otherwise, uh, what are you going about it? You spend a lot of time putting into the back end a lot of rules and regulations on how to figure out the DJUs for all the different verticals. Yeah, so there's a couple things around that story, because uh, you're right in the sense that it's the people composing the use case for the end user who understand what, is, what does duplicates mean. Um, but the further away data travels from its origin, before you throw away the duplicates means you're adding cost to the whole pipeline. So a principle that's existed for many decades now, back in the old database days, was discarding data you want to push as low in the stack as possible. Okay. So we try to build a system where the people designing the use case can inform us of how, what to look for to do the dedo. So we can at least throw away stuff earlier in the stack before it's traveled through too many servers. Um, for some things, we actually look at can we change the way the index looks so that you can do some of the deduping even within a single shard before it leaves the, that server. So there's different ways of trying to tune that because uh, it's, it's a very old story about how do you optimize data processing systems. And 
some of those laws just don't change. Uh, I have fun joking with people back when I was doing database stuff at uh, Claris, which is a subsidiary of Apple. So I was the token Unix person there, who, uh, and there's a whole bunch of folks who were great at Mac UIs and uh, Windows UIs, and, and they said, we don't let Unix people touch user interfaces. And I responded back, well, the kind of stuff I work on is described in hardback books. The stuff they work on is described in softbound books. Because that stuff is constantly changing, whereas the universe I operate in, a lot of the rules uh, hold true for many decades. A lot of stuff we do in search engines is not new. Uh, it's simply old policies. We've got a new way of applying what was learned many years ago and take it from there. We've got a related question yeah. on facet, accuracy of facet counts and total result counts when you do a deduplication. Mm -hmm. Is that something, um, some, some search engines typically have issues uh, when you do duplication detection dynamic query time to get an accurate result count, especially for the facets. Is that something you do, a uh, system it does? So we built the system so that if the use case demands it, we can do both. We can produce an accurate account and do deduping. Now there's some scenarios where um, some classes of aggregation uh, or aspect counting uh, end up just being really too messy in the dedupe story. So there are some cases we can't do. We've tried really hard to allow the, the people constructing the use case to get accurate counts, uh, though we also, from a cost management pers perspective, encourage them to not do that. Uh, accurate counts in a world of a rapidly changing collection of documents is a real pain in the butt. Uh, costs a fair amount of money, and one of the wrestlings with is um, the cost of producing accurate counts versus the cost of giving the user useful information. Are there other ways to express to the user the same information they would get from those counts without them being accurate? As soon as they don't have to be accurate, then I can do a lot of optimization tricks. Um, and so we have discussions between the search front-end folks and the search back-end folks about uh, those kinds of things. Another question related to schema silos, there are a huge number of schemas. If there's a requirement to search against multiple schemas, would you support a federation? Or what's the strategy for it? Or um, I'm not sure if you have such a requirement. So we do have federation built into the stack. Even Voyager had federation in it, so it's not, in and of itself, it's not something new to eBay. Uh, we've tried to provide a more, more general capabilities around that, where you can send a query to two different kinds of indexes and then combine the results <coughs> together. What are the algorithms that you use for merging? Is it just round robin, or do you do a, a relevancy score normalization as well? Uh, you can use relevancy and other scoring things. Um, typically, that scenario of blending results which from different indexes, which just happens to be internal, we actually call it blending. I don't know uh, how you. I, I think of one kind of uh, coalescing of results as sort of scatter gather, which is you're, you've got a whole bunch of documents that were scored with the same rank function. So you can do a simple merge sort, you might say, to recombine the results. When you're searching against different kinds of content, but you still want to create a blended experience for the user, then you have to look at other signals. You can't just simply rely on the raw score. So we've provided hooks in the system where at the point that you're trying to combine uh, different kinds of sources, you can use a new algorithms to figure out how to stitch those two things together and have different policies. A lot of times you get in a situation where you have to move out of the universe of scoring documents in isolation to looking at the collection of documents and in that informing you how to combine them. You know, how many results did I get from each of those things? That can inform 
how you want to combine them together. You know, what's the range of rank scores in one versus the range of rank scores in another? A whole variety of things like that that influence how you do these final kind of blending kinds of things. Whereas a simple scatter gather of shards, you can get away with just simple score each document in isolation and just slap them together according to a simple sort rule. And the range of rank scores might vary too, depending on the query as well, right? Yeah, so whoever's writing this blending stuff, they can use, we've designed so you can look at you know, what's the highest score from this set versus the highest score from that set and try to th use that to inform the, the blending stuff. Do you support auto sharding? Or, you know, if you had to scale out, uh, if you want to have more number of shards, or if you have over, uh, use the shard capacity, how do you do? Auto sharding is that built in? Um, I'm not sure if I call it auto sharding from a uh, operations perspective. Uh, we've designed the system so that we can change the sharding without having to shut down the cluster. Routing is it, is it similar to routing? You would route to new shard if you have. Um, I don't want to get too much into that, but in, in a you know, high availability, multiple data center company like eBay, you have a couple strategies you can follow. You can say, well, I'm just going to do a rotating maintenance window, and every now and then I'll shut down the servers in one of my data centers and, and change their shape or things like that. Uh, we generally don't like doing that. Uh, I mean, sometimes you have to, but we don't like to, so we've tried to design the system so that while a cluster is running and serving queries, we could uh, add more shard serving capacity to it. Um, though frankly, if, if I've got a maintenance window coming up anyways for some other reason, I might just wait till then. Because it is more work to uh, reshape a, a running grid than a grid that's been turned off. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's quite answering your question, but... Okay, but what are the strategies that you apply in case of uh, an index being corrupt, do you do you have a way to refeed the content back to recreate the index or copy the index from a different uh, clone? What are the typical strategies that you follow for such scenarios? Um, the we we try hard to follow one simple rule, which is when stuff happens, or substitute your own word there, uh, roll back first. Uh, now, roll back in a universe of constantly changing data is more interesting. It's kind of challenging. Uh, but that's sort of the first principle of, it. first thing is keep the site up. And usually some form of roll back is, is go back to what I know was working earlier is the driving principle. Now, there's different ways we actually try to accomplish that in a dynamic world. Um, I think, I'm sorry, I think I missed some of aspect of your question there. But. I was thinking, you know, if we had to, I mean, if, if it rolled back into the strategy, um, then you, I'm assuming you have backup sub index to roll back to. Um, sometimes, if you don't have a backup, you have to repeat the entire content again to create the index. What's the best strategy to do it? You know, crawling the source might take too much amount of time. Yeah. Is there a, a content store? Um, um, so, so we've doubled up on some of the use cases and requirements in the sense I talked earlier about how algorithmic freshness is important to us, which means I need to be able to, on a regular basis, just rebuild the whole index. Okay. So what we looked at it saying, okay, we've got a variety of drivers for, I want to quickly rebuild an index. So, how many use cases can I serve by that capacity? So, we have user-facing improvements that are one driver. Can I also use this notion of when uh, stuff happens, how do I deal with it? Well, I can use that capacity also to deal with that. Uh, it's just a general principle. We try not to come with lots, up with lots of different solutions to lots of different problems. If I can find one solution, if I make that a little bit more robust, it 
will solve five problems for me. That's generally a, a better way to go. More questions? Uh, I do have so one more slide, two more slides. Um, query language. So I was one thing um, we did that might uh, seem funny to some folks is you could say that we actually don't have a query language. Um, so there are different query languages out there. You think of you know, how do people type queries into Google or use Solar or things like that. There are all sorts of sort of text query languages. How do I describe what I want the system to do for me in a blob of text? And as we were getting into a lot of these uh, more interesting or more crazy query expansion stories or how do we reinterpret what the user actually meant, um, it was a lot easier to not get too focused on having a always have to have a human readable text blob to describe all the intermediate states that a query evolves through. So, let's, so we move the design focus to saying, let's ignore text representation as design focus. We're going to design around a more object-oriented kind of way of thinking about describing a query. We still need those text languages in different parts of the system, but there's no requirement that everything you can do in the search engine be described with one BNF grammar. We simply threw that out the window. Um, and given that we're in a world of most of the queries are actually machine generated, you know, the user only typed in a few words, everything else was machine generated. There's not a lot of internal value to how we build the system to focus on a text query language. Also, the fact that we decided to have a client-side library instead of a URL or a wire protocol also allowed us to walk away from focusing on a single text query language. Uh, now, it's still very frustrating to folks that they really would love to have a text query language, would like to tweak things, and what if I just change this one little thing? How can I change this little thing? So, to accommodate that, we need to give them better tools to interact with the the parse tree or object-oriented description of a query to do those kinds of tweaks. Uh, but frankly, this allows us to move a lot faster. Uh, because with ranking, and we get into 